I'm going to introduce the person we've all been waiting to hear, and I can't believe he is here with us today. We're thrilled. Dr. Mark Soames is best known for his discovery of the four brain mechanisms of dreaming and his pioneering use of psychoanalytic methods and theories in contemporary neuroscience. Educated at the University of the Waterstrand, Johannesburg, Professor Soames moved to London in 1988 where he worked at the Royal London Hospital. He was an honorary lecturer in neurosurgery while he trained at the Institute of Psychoanalysis at the same time. He returned to South Africa in 2002 where he now holds a professorship in neuropsychology at the University of Cape Town. He is president of the South African Psychoanalytic Association member of the British Psychoanalytic Society, and honorary member of the New York Psychoanalytic Society. His honors include the George Saturn Medal for contributions to the history and philosophy of science, the International Psychiatrist Award for contributions to American psychiatry, from the American Psychiatric Association, and the Sigourney Prize for contributions to psychoanalysis. For those who don't know it, that prize has been likened to the Nobel Prize of Psychoanalysis. He is chair of the research committee of the International Psychoanalytic Association. He has published more than 300 papers in both neuroscientific and psychoanalytic journals, and five books, including The Neuropsychology of Dreams in 1997, Clinical Studies in Neuropsychoanalysis in 2000, The Brain and the Inner World in 2002, his last book was actually a bestseller and was translated into nine languages. He's the editor of the revised standard edition of the complete psychological works of Sigmund Freud and the forthcoming complete neuroscientific works of Sigmund Freud. Freud. So I don't know how you do it. <laughs> but we'd like to invite Dr. Soames to come up and speak with us. speaker. <laughs> and um, if you're going to have cause to throw things at me, I think it's going to be because I have to try to squeeze so much into the time available uh, 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 to all of us. Uh, the whole day is very packed. But this part is going to be super packed. Um, I know that there are four or five of you who were at the New York Psychoanalytic Institute yesterday where I gave a talk on the same topic as we're speaking about today. And uh, those five or four of you are going to have the amusing experience of seeing me trying to cover in one hour what I covered yesterday in two hours. Um, so you can see from my title, if the id is conscious, where and what is the unconscious, that I'm covering two things. The first is the fact that the id is conscious. I don't think I can assume that you're all persuaded of that fact, um, which is the premise of the second part of my talk. So I'm going to spend quite some time um, outlining the argument for the view, uh, which I believe, as you will see, is incontrovertible, that the id is in fact conscious. Uh, then, uh, in the remaining time, I will t uh, consider the question, where then is the unconscious? Because one of the big confusions that arose from my first presenting this idea that the id is conscious was the notion that therefore there is no unconscious. And that's, nothing could be further from the truth. Of course, all of you who are psychoanalytical clinicians know that that would be a nonsense. So um, it's that that I'm wanting to then turn my attention to, to explain how I conceive or the, how I conceptualize the unconscious in light of the fact that the id is conscious. Um, here's a little summary of my argument. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's very asymmetrical. Really, I'm going to spend the majority of my time on this uh, sort of uh, reviewing the argument that the id is conscious and that the ego is unconscious. Then I'll whiz through all of this and we'll get into the second, um, which is the, the second, you know, the, the, the second issue. That how are we then to conceive of the unconscious? And then if there's time, I will talk about clinical implications. If, I, I, when I say if there's time, I really don't know if I'll be able to get to these clinical implications. And if necessary, I will weave those in to um, the, the, after, uh, the, the second part you know, the, with the discussants. 
Okay, so, now, remember part one. I'm going to try to persuade you of the view that the id is in fact conscious and that the ego is unconscious. I'm going to do that in two um, sections. Firstly, I'm going to review the brain science and then I'm going to review uh, Freud's theory. Um, when I review the brain science, I'm going to be doing two things. Firstly, I'm going to be speaking about how the body is represented in the brain. And I'm going to show you that the body is represented twice over. There are two radically different aspects of the body uh, represented in the brain. And these two aspects of the body, which I call the external and the internal body, respectively, these two aspects of the body are represented in radically different ways in the brain. And this has massive implications for our understanding of, of consciousness, of the brain basis of consciousness. So the second thing I'm going to be doing in the neuroscience part of the presentation is, uh, apart from the, the, the showing you how these two aspects of the body are represented in the brain, I'm going to show you how this gives rise to two different types of consciousness. And in doing so, I'm going to show you that we have to radically revise our view of the brain basis of consciousness. I know there are a few neuroscientists and neuropsychologists in the audience, and I hope that even you will learn something uh, from this part of my presentation. Uh, after that, as I said, I'll go on to Freud and show the, uh, discuss the implications of these neuroscientific findings for our basic model of the mind. And then uh, lastly, as I said, if I have time, I'll talk about clinical implications. Okay, so here we go. Those are cranial nerves, um, and why I have that on the screen is I want to start with the sort of common sense view of consciousness. The common sense view um, gave rise to the first sort of formalized philosophies uh, of mind in relation to consciousness, Hume and Locke and the British empiricists, who just um, uh, formalized the common sense view that you will be experiencing right now, which is that consciousness derives from our senses. The contents of consciousness, the ingredients, if you will, of consciousness, uh, 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 consist in five sensory modalities. Vision, hearing, somatic sensation, colloquially referred to as touch, so vision, hearing, touch, smell, and taste. If you think about it for a moment, and if you experience it for a moment, although don't go tasting each other, uh, you will uh, recognize the commonsensical basis for what I've just said. What else does consciousness consist in but these five ingredients? So that was the common sense view. That in the, gave rise to British empiricist philosophy, which in turn was then the organizing principle for the early neuroscientists. And when I say early, I mean up until roughly now, um, certainly up until the turn of the last century, uh, the, the 1990s, uh, our view was that consciousness was a property of the cortex and that um, we specifically um, um, localized the different aspects of consciousness to the different primary projection zones for the different sensory modalities. The best known of these is the cortical homunculus, the little person in your head. Um, there is over here a map of the sensory surface of the body, uh, and literally a map, uh, where your head is here, your hand is here, uh, your torso is there, your genitals, if I may mention them, are over there, and your legs uh, hang over um, the other side. And this little, this little person in your head faces backwards. There's also a motor person, this is the, this is the, sen the somatosensory person in your head. Now, the same principle applies to all the sensory modalities. There's a little map of the back of your eyes over there, which, which creates an image uh, of the, the visual field. And then you have a little map here for, for the auditory modality. And inside there, you have maps for gustation and olfaction. That's how it works. This is all old news. Um, the, 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 I'm not telling you anything that you didn't always know. Um, what is sort of news, although you know, uh, not anymore, but over the last few decades, it became increasingly apparent that what the cortex does, all of the, uh, the perceptual modalities that I've just referred to, they can receive sensory information without consciousness. You can see and hear, etc., without knowing that you're seeing and hearing. So this was a sort of a discovery, in fact, a sort of a rediscovery, what Freud knew uh, 100 years earlier, um, which is that uh, all manner of mental processes can occur without consciousness. I refer here to perception, but in fact the same applies to all the cognitive processes derived from perception. So um, you can not only see consciously, you can read consciously, you can recognize faces consciously, you can discriminate shapes consciously, 
you can calculate, I mean, oh, sorry, unconsciously, all of that, yeah. backtrack and change, the, re-edit what I just said, unconsciously, all of that stuff can be done without consciousness. And um, this is, the, as I say, the rediscovery of the unconscious that occurred in cognitive neuroscience over the last few decades. And it has, in fact, culminated in the interesting question, if we can do all of this cognition and perception, all of these mental gymnastics without consciousness, then what is consciousness for? It's such a troublesome thing. If you can do all of that without consciousness, the question arises, well, why is it there at all? Okay, so that is a very quick uh, summary of how um, uh, of how um, consciousness is generated in the cortex, of how it relates to the, the, the classical sensory modalities, and uh, the, I'm ending with this, with this problem that in fact it can also do all of that stuff without consciousness. So um, the, the, the processes that the cortex performs evidently are not intrinsically conscious at all. That's the external body mapped onto the external surface of the brain onto the cerebral cortex. You got the point? I'm moving on. <laughs> now here's the other aspect of the body, the internal body. The internal body is represented in the brain in the brain stem. These red structures um, are not all of the structures in question, but they are the big ticket items. There's the area of the stremo, the nucleus uh, solitaris, parabrachial nucleus, there's the circumventricular organs, and the big ticket item uh, is the hypothalamus. These structures receive information not from the external musculoskeletal sensory motor body, but from the visceral body, from the autonomic vegetative body, from the jellyfish inside of you. And uh, what these structures do is monitor and regulate the internal milieu, the bodily economy, and specifically, and most importantly, your vital needs. Uh, it's slightly alarming to um, recognize that the survival of the body is dependent upon a number of parameters uh, in regard to vital needs remaining within a very tight range. For example, there's a very narrow range of oxygenation uh, which is consistent with life. If you go out of that range, you're dead. The same applies to water, the same applies to salt, to sugar, uh, to core body temperature, etc. This is what I mean by vital needs. And incidentally, when I speak of vital needs, I include here also the reproductive functions of the body. Um, when the, the, the way in which the body is, as it were, designed by evolutionary biology, of course, absolutely central to that is the reproductive function because that is how genes get passed on. So the monitoring of the internal milieu of these vital survival and sexual functions of the body uh, are monitored by these red structures. Now, here's an important point. As you deviate from uh, the set point, there's a set point, there's an ideal amount of oxygen, sugar, water, etc. that your body needs, uh, and there's a very narrow range around that set point that is compatible with life. Uh, as you deviate from those set points, what do you do about it? You can't think, uh, gosh, I need sugar. <clears throat> There you have it, I fixed it. <laughs> and the same applies to all the other vital needs, including reproduction. You masturbate as much as you like, you're not going to reproduce. So the, the point is that all of these vital needs ultimately de de require the organism, and we are organisms in this respect, they require us to engage with the external world. That's the only place that you can meet your vital needs. It's the only way you can regulate these internal um, uh, parameters that I'm uh, referring to. And if I may give you a little bit of philosophy here, philosophy of life, that is why life is difficult. You have to go out into the world and engage with objects uh, if you're going to stay alive and reproduce. Sorry. <laughs> uh, now, these red structures project to these purple structures. Again, I've only shown some of them, uh, with some major representatives. Um, here's the raphe nucleus, here's the periaductal gray, um, uh, uh, there's the ventral tegmental area, um, these are um, uh, non-specific aspects of the thalamus and so on. These structures collectively are called the reticular activating system or the extended reticular thalamic activating system. And what these structures, these are the structures that the red structures project onto. What they do is they arouse or activate, as the name suggests, the forebrain. Why do they do that? They activate the forebrain to go out into the world and to do stuff. Because, as I said, that's the only place where you can meet your vital needs. Um, the, 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 these purple structures 
activate the forebrain by rendering the forebrain conscious. And this was a surprise when we discovered it in the 1950s, because as I said, we previously thought on the basis of common sense and the basis of British empiricist philosophy, we, we, we assumed that consciousness flows in, as it were, through our sensory organs. Um, but uh, Magoon and Maruzzi discovered in the early 1950s that in fact consciousness is an endogenous property of the brain, and it's generated by these structures in the upper brain stem. Uh, the way that they, they did a series of experiments, and it's not only Magoon and Maruzzi, they worked with cats, there were also the famous Penfield and Jaspers who worked with human beings with seizure disorders, what they showed, uh, Penfield showed, was that a seizure only leads to the loss of consciousness once it recruits these what they call centrencephalic um, uh, structures, these upper brainstem structures. What Magoon and Maruzzi showed was that in cats, likewise, consciousness, the cat becomes conscious um, by dint of the activation of these deep nuclei and that it loses consciousness by dint of the deactivation of these deep nuclei. Uh, the way that they uh, discovered this, and there were a series of experiments, and again I must emphasize it wasn't only Magoon and Maruzzi, and it wasn't only cats, but um, the, the observation was, the, the prediction was made that if you sever all the sensory inputs to the brain, the cat would fall asleep, or possibly even fall into a coma. And this was on the basis of the old theory that consciousness derives from our senses. But what happened when the, when the inputs to the, to, to the brain, uh, the, the, the classical sensory inputs were severed, was that the cats did not fall asleep and did not fall into a coma. In fact, they became rather agitated little cats. Uh, and if you think about it for a moment, you might likewise be rather agitated if we removed all of your sensory contact with the world. It wouldn't feel so nice. And uh, so the cats, uh, rather than falling asleep or falling into coma, uh, became, as I say, very activated and very, and very agitated. But they did still have a normal sleep-waking cycle. So this demonstrated that the somewhere else, and this is what Magoon and Maruzzi identified, the somewhere else was here, um, the sleep-waking cycle is in fact regulated there. So the becoming awake and going to sleep, the regulation of consciousness occurs in the upper brain stem. It does not, in fact, the consciousness does not stream in. From the, extra, from the external senses. Now, um, you might think of what I've just said to you, what I've told you, it was in the 1950s that we discovered this, so where's the radical change in our theory of consciousness? Well, um, the, when Magoon and Maruzzi discovered this, and as I said, there was a surprise to them, it was not what they predicted, uh, how they dealt with the discovery was the way that scientists always dis deal with unexpected discoveries. That is, they fudged it. They, they thought, how can we fit the new findings into our old theory? Uh, we don't generally give up our theories. Uh, we generally try to fit incompatible facts into them by, as I say, fudging it. And the way that Magoon and Maruzzi fudged it was like this. They said, well, uh, it is still true that consciousness derives from our external sensory modalities. It's still true that the ingredients of consciousness are those perceptual modalities, uh, that these are the contents of consciousness. And then they said, what this part of the brain does is supplies the level of consciousness. That's how they budged it. So they, they um, invented this new dimension of consciousness, which is a purely quantitative one. How much consciousness is there? It's a sort of volume control, um, as opposed to what quality does the consciousness have? The qualities come still from the external sensory modalities. So that was the old view, level versus contents, quantity of consciousness versus qualities of consciousness, and since the 1950s we've stuck with that fudge. And that's the thing that's changed in the 1990s and here and now, it's busy changing before our eyes. We've realized that this is absolutely not true. Um, how, uh, the, the, the level of consciousness is measured by, for example, um, neurosurgeons, uh, when dealing with uh, brain trauma, you measure on the Glasgow Coma Scale how much consciousness is there. 15 is what you aspire to, 3 is the bottom of the scale. It's quite funny actually, even if you're dead you get 3. <laughs> um, that's this quantitative level aspect. So neurosurgeons are interested in it, neurologists are interested in it, and likewise anaesthetists are interested in your level of consciousness, and you're also very interested um, in your level of consciousness in the anaesthetic sense of the word if you're about to have a big operation. But it's not only anaesthetists and the like who are interested in this part of the brain and its, and its contribution to consciousness. And here I'm uh, setting up the, the, the basis for the change in our view. 
It is also psychiatrists who are interested in this part of the brain, although many of them seem not to realize it. I know some of my best friends are psychiatrists, and I know there's some psychiatrists in the audience today, but really it is quite frightening how, how much psychiatrists don't know about the brain. So here, uh, these structures, let me just uh, illustrate um, uh, the, the um, uh, 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 did I say earlier, I said raphe, this is nucleus, uh, locus ceruleus complex, here's, here's the raphe over here. The dorsal raphe nucleus is the source um, region for the serotonergic projections to the forebrain. So when you take an SSRI, an antidepressant, the famous Prozac, what you're doing, in fact, is manipulating what this cell, con what this cell group contributes to consciousness. You're manipulating serotonin. Uh, if you take antipsychotics, uh, you're manipulating uh, the, the, the projection. The, 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 this, these are the source cells for dopaminergic projections, and antipsychotics act on this dopamine system. So uh, antipsychotics, antidepressants, psychiatric drugs which affect mood and emotion, you know, th this is what psychiatry is all about, um, th 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 they also are these um, structures in the brain which are supposedly without quality. And there you see the contradiction. This is not just a matter of level of consciousness, it's not just a matter of quantity. It's a, it's, it feels like something to be awake. And I hope you've noticed. <laughs> and when I said earlier that uh, imagine how you would feel if you were one of those cats who'd had uh, their, their cortical, um, in fact, in, there were also experiments not only with the input uh, uh, being removed, but the whole of the cortex being removed. Uh, I, I, I said, how would you feel uh, if, you, if you suddenly lost all of your sensory inputs? And uh, that, of course, would be an oxymoron if it were true that consciousness, um, the, the quality, the feeling of being conscious, uh, was bound up with what streams in through your sense organs, because then you shouldn't surely feel anything at all. Uh, and you do. What do you feel? You feel your feelings. And there you see it. It is absolutely astonishing that for a hundred years of behavioral neuroscience, um, the, 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 the neuroscience of consciousness left out feelings. The contents of consciousness do not consist only in what you see here, taste, smell, etc., but also in emotion. Emotion is a quality of consciousness, God knows. And uh, uh, as I say, it's amazing that this was left out. So this is the innovation that uh, came in the 1990s. Uh, Jak Panksepp, more than anyone else, was responsible for the recognition that these upper brainstem structures which generate consciousness in the so-called level of consciousness are in fact the brain basis for emotion, for affect, for feelings. Um, if I can illustrate the point with reference to this little structure, the periaqueductal gray. The periaqueductal gray is the size of a jelly bean in the human brain, and it is the smallest area of brain tissue which, uh, when damaged, leads to a total obliteration of consciousness. So it's quite alarming if you think about that for a moment. All of you here and now, this is not a theory, this is a fact. You know, we're not talking about metaphors here. You, all of you, have in your heads right now a periaqueductal gray the size of a jelly bean, and if it were to be damaged, you would go into a coma your consciousness would disappear. It is dependent upon such a small piece of tissue. <coughs> so um, the point I'm wanting to make about periaqueductal gray, uh, in order to, to illustrate the general point about this part of the brain, uh, uh, the these structures not only contributing quantity of consciousness, this is the most con concentrated, uh, condensed, uh, consciousness-producing tissue in, uh, known to man. Uh, and if you stimulate the dorsal surface, the back part, the, the, the dorsal columns of the periaqueductal gray, uh, what you generate is intense unpleasure, extremely unpleasant states of consciousness, fear, pain, and there's nothing that the patient wants more than that you should switch off the stimulator. It's absolutely horrendous. Uh, likewise, if you, not likewise, conversely, if you stimulate the ventral periaqueductal gray, you get orgasmic pleasures, just absolutely deliriously delightful, wonderful feelings. And there's nothing that the patient wants more than that you keep the stimulator going. <laughs> so there you have it. The most intense quantitative level of consciousness producing structure that there is, is also the most intensively affective structure imaginable. So to make the point again, clearly as I can, consciousness uh, in the brainstem sense of the word is not a quantitative thing. It's not a level thing. It's a state of consciousness. The state of being conscious feels like something 
and the quality that I'm talking about is emotional affective feeling. That is the background state of consciousness within which all of those external contents are embedded. Please uh, 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 be clear on this point. The background state of consciousness, the being of consciousness, the subjective I am conscious of these external inputs is affective. It's feeling. That is the big discovery. And Damasio, by the way, gradually came to the same view in the 90s and, and the early years of this century. So Panksip and Damasio are probably the, 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 the names that you most need to remember in regard to this reformulation of consciousness. Now, everything that I've said to you so far is fact. Here's another fact. The, the, the extra-receptive modalities of consciousness, the cortical forms of consciousness, are dependent upon the upper brainstem form of consciousness. If you remove the visual cortex or you remove the somatosensory cortex, you will remove a certain content, a certain type of information from consciousness. But you will not remove consciousness itself. I've sort of made this point already. But the opposite does not apply. If you remove these upper brainstem structures, you remove consciousness in its totality. So there is a hierarchical relationship between the external modalities of consciousness and the endogenous state of consciousness. The endogenous state of consciousness, which I much emph must emphasize again, is affective, is the bedrock of consciousness. It's the, it's the basic stuff of consciousness. It is being conscious. And then the being conscious gets extended upwards onto these cortical structures, which secondarily renders them conscious. And this makes sense of what I said to you earlier, that those cortical structures do their business whether or not they're conscious. So the cortex is processing extra-receptive information and the representations derived from extra-receptive uh, 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 information, that is perception and cognition, all of the stuff that the cortex does, it does it with or without consciousness. And it is the upper brain stem which then secondarily um, adds consciousness to them so that you can feel your way into your cognitions. This is the absolutely essential point that I'm wanting to convey. Consciousness in the extra-receptive sense is secondary. It is contingent. It depends upon the state of being conscious. It is the subject of consciousness who generates the consciousness. And then it extends upwards. So I feel like this about that. That's how consciousness works. Um, if I had time, I could go into lots of interesting things that flow from this. For example, the qualia problem, this explains the qualia problem. The binding problem, it explains the binding, it resolves the binding problem. Those of you who are interested in these philosophy of minds matters will know what I'm talking about, but I don't have time to go into all of it. Just remember the basic thing is that consciousness comes from within. It comes from the upper brainstem. It is a state and it feels like something. And secondarily, it's extended onto cortical cognition, and that's how you're able to feel your cognitions, to, that is to say, to, to possess them in consciousness. They don't float there by themselves. The cortex is intrinsically unconscious. Um, before I leave this slide, I must mention these little white arrows. These are limbic circuits, um, and it's important to um, recognize that these circuits uh, 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 add to the basic pleasures and unpleasures of the upper brainstem very specific varieties of pleasure and unpleasure. So that you have a fear circuit and you have a rage circuit and you have a foraging circuit and you have an attachment circuit and so on. These are uh, go beyond the mere monitoring of bodily state uh, and they extend onto preconceptions of certain kinds of relations to the external world which are built into the brain. So the, the, the feeling aspect of consciousness doesn't consist only in pleasure and unpleasure. That's the sort of upper brainstem level, the vertebrate level. We share that with fishes. Uh, but then higher than that are these limbic circuits, which are, which are not only mammalian, but the ones I have here are mammalian circuits, um, which are things which evolved off, uh, out of, the elaborations of, the basic pleasure and unpleasure variety of consciousness. All of this is fact. None of this is theory. I'm now wanting to tell you one piece of theory. And here again, I'm referring to Tony Damasio. Damasio was of the view, and I am absolutely persuaded of it, and if any of you has a better view, I want to hear it, um, that the reason why consciousness evolved at all, remember I asked earlier, what's consciousness for? What does it add? Uh, why do we need it? Damasio's view was, well, in terms of these bodily parameters that I mentioned earlier, it's very important to know whether you're moving away from that set point that's uh, essential for life. 
How do you know you're moving away from it? Damasio uh, suggests by dint of unpleasurable feelings. It starts to feel bad as you're about to cop it. You know, if you, if you don't have enough uh, water, it feels bad, and it feels bad in a particular way. You feel thirst, and it's a variety of unpleasure. If you lack um, uh, basic nutrients, you feel hunger. It's a variety of unpleasure. Uh, and if you need to defecate, likewise. You know, there are these, the, the deviations from the set point uh, 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 are, are felt by the organism, that's us, are felt as feelings, as unpleasurable feelings, and conversely, as you move back to the set point, so you feel pleasure. And according to Damasio, and this, as I say, is the theory that I think is you know, right on, but it's a theory, the, the, the purpose of being conscious, says Damasio, is so that you can feel how are you doing within this biological scale of values. There must be some way of knowing how you're doing, and uh, uh, Damasio's argument is that uh, this is what feeling does. Feeling makes you aware that anything that's bad for your survival and reproductive success feels unpleasant, and anything that's good for your survival and reproductive success feels pleasant, and this is how the basic mechanism of consciousness works. Very important to remember that, and as I said, there also then are these varieties of pleasure and unpleasure which are higher than the basic sort of vertebrate level of things. So that's the only piece of theory in what I'm telling, what I've told you so far. That uh, regardless of whether you accept the theory or not, the fact remains that these body monitoring structures project onto these the forebrain activating structures and that these forebrain activating structures generate the state of consciousness. The state of consciousness is emotional and that there are varieties of emotion that arise from those and that all of this is the basis of all consciousness. That the cortical forms of consciousness are only secondarily activated by this primary uh, affective state of feeling. There you have it. That's how it works. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> now we, oh, let me just show you. Here's a child who has no, no, no cortex, well, very little bits of cortex. Uh, you know, you can see there where there should be cortex, there's cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, I just wanted to illustrate, uh, there's been tons and tons of evidence, of course, for what I've said, but I just thought this was quite a, 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 a um, simple and concrete and easy to understand um, a, a, um, illustration. But this is the child who scanned you just saw. There she has no cortex. And here she is, you put her baby brother on her chest, and she goes, ah! You know, she feels this kind of attachment, nurture, and feeling from one of those limbic circuits that I referred to earlier. And uh, she is patently conscious, and she's patently conscious in an affective sense. And uh, the same applies to all the other basic emotions. This child is capable of being conscious, or she has a normal sleep-waking cycle. As it happens, she also has absence seizures, so she loses consciousness. Even her parents can see when she's lost consciousness. Consciousness is there, even though she doesn't have a cortex. Consciousness and affect are there, even though she doesn't have a cortex. And the same applies to all of these kids. This is a condition called hydranencephaly. Uh, here's another one. Um, you know, tell me that she's not conscious. Those of you who want to uh, argue that point, um, there's a whole lot that we can say about that, but I think it's probably best to whiz over that. That's just to illustrate the point that I was making earlier as to the affective brainstem basis of consciousness. Okay, now we go to Freud. Remember what I've said to you so far is that there are two aspects of uh, the body that are represented in the brain. The external body is, is, is mapped onto the cortical surface and gives rise to these qualities of consciousness that we call our sensory modalities. Uh, and then there's the internal aspect of the body which is um, monitored by these core brainstem structures which give rise to affect and that there's a hierarchical relationship between the two, the, the extraceptive cortical type of consciousness is dependent upon the interoceptive affective type of consciousness. And the, these, uh, so the, you see how the two aspects of consciousness relate to the two aspects of the body and the two different ways in which they're mapped onto the brain. I'm now going to show you that Freud had exactly the same model. So here's Freud in the ego and the id, he says, the ego is first and foremost a bodily ego. It's not merely a surface entity, but is itself the projection of a surface. If we wish to, to find an anatomical analogy for it, we can best identify it with the cortical homunculus of the anatomists, which stands on its head in the cortex, sticks up its heels, faces backwards, and as we know, has its feature on the left-hand side. 
That's Freud, you see what I mean. You know, the ego, says Freud, derives from external perception. External perception uh, derives from the surface of the body. The surface of the body is mapped onto the surface of the brain. And this, by Freud, Freud there says, by this I mean the cortex. And there we have these little maps of the surface of our body. And this is what the ego is derived from. The ego is derived from ex extraceptive experience. Here he elaborates, he says, that is, the ego is ultimately derived from bodily sensations, chiefly from those springing from the surface of the body. It may thus be regarded as a mental projection of the surface of the body, besides, as we have seen above, representing the superficies of the mental apparatus. And what he's referring to there is the system perceptual consciousness in his model of the mental apparatus. Right at the top, there's a little lens, uh, a, a, a little sort of a perceptual organ, uh, which is called the system perceptual con perception uh, consciousness, PCPTCS, you all know that thing. That's what he means by the superficies of the mental apparatus. I, I, I don't want to belabor the point. I hope that you can see what I mean. You know, Freud had an idea of where the ego derives from, which is exactly the same as what I showed you about the external body vis-a-vis uh, -vis the cortex. So we can move on. Now Freud speaks of the id. He says, the id cut off from the external world, has a world of perception of its own. It detects with extraordinary acuteness certain changes in its interior, especially oscillations in the tensions of its instinctual needs. And these changes become conscious as feelings in the pleasure-unpleasure series. It's hard to say, to be sure, by what means and with the help of what sensory terminal organs these perceptions come about, but it's an established fact that self-perceptions, kinesthetic feelings and feelings of pleasure and pleasure govern the passage of events in the id with despotic force. The id obeys the inexorable pleasure principle. So this is the internal body. Freud is saying that the id derives uh, 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 its, its uh, 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 qualities from the interior of the body, specifically in oscillations in instinctual needs, and these are felt in the pleasure and pleasure series. Uh, what does Freud mean by instinctual needs? Well, happily, he, he defines it for us. He says, an instinct uh, appears to us as a concept on the frontier between the mental and the somatic, as the psychical representative of the stimuli originating from within the organism and reaching the mind, as a measure of the demand made upon the mind for work in consequence of its connection with the body, the internal body. So, you see, Freud... Uh, exactly what I just said to you about the internal body and how it's mapped onto the brain, that, uh, that part of the body and its mapping onto the brain performs the functions that Freud called it. It's as clear as a bell. Um, so Freud saw cortex as, uh, ego as derived from cortical uh, 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 perceptual modalities, and he saw um, it as derived from, this, from the, the, the monitoring of the internal milieu. In case you think I'm neurologizing Freud, uh, let me point out um, that here he says, it will be seen that there's nothing daringly new in these assumptions. We have merely adopted the views on localization held by cerebral anatomy, which locates the seat of consciousness in the cerebral cortex, the outermost enveloping layer of the central organ. He goes on to say, I wonder why it isn't safely housed somewhere in its innermost interior. Well, actually it is. So, you know, there you have it. Uh, I'm not, as I say, neurologizing this. this. The way Freud saw it, Freud was a neurologist. The way Freud saw the ego and the id was the way that I've just described, the, 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 the way in which the body is mapped onto the brain in the two different aspects that I've described. So there you have it. Um, here's the brain, here's Freud's mental apparatus, and you can see his perceptual system and uh, this uh, motor aspect of it the pre-conscious system over there, the, the memory traces derived from perception over there, um, and uh, these uh, dr instinctual drive thingies over here, uh, coming from the interior of the body over there. That's the id, that's the ego, there you have it. Summary of what I've said to you so far, and I hope you can spot the mistake. This is for dramatic effect. This <laughs> What is the time? Good Lord, what time did I start speaking? 10.30, okay, God. For a moment I thought I was half an hour out. Okay, so here's the mistake. See that word, unconscious. Mm -hmm. So all of this maps onto all of this exactly, as you can see, there's just no controversy about it, except here's the problem, that this is not unconscious. It's wrong. That is not conscious. 
That's wrong. This is intrinsically unconscious. The ego is intrinsically unconscious. The id is intrinsically conscious. Consciousness derives from the id. The id is the font of all consciousness. It is where feelings come from. So Freud had it absolutely back to front. And uh, it's not his fault. You know, everyone thought that, that cortex was conscious, and Freud was just following in an old tradition, uh, but that tradition, sadly, is wrong. And therefore, his view that the ego is conscious and that the id is unconscious is, is back to front, which has massive implications, which I hope we're going to get to today. Because let's just uh, uh, take, uh, for example, the talking cure. The mechanism of the talking cure, which is the whole thing you know, of psychoanalysis, the idea is that we need to bring consciousness down here. Consciousness exists up here. And the value of words in the talking cure, says Freud, is that they are derived from external perception. Therefore, we can render them conscious. We can have the memory traces derived from words that uh, are pre-conscious. They can be rendered conscious. And so we can think things, you know, abstract things in consciousness, and we can attach those words to these inchoate things down here, and that's how we can make this stuff, this stuff conscious. That's the whole, the whole mechanism of the talking cure. You've got to drag consciousness down into the id so that you can think it. But, as I've just told you, in fact, the consciousness starts here, and it has extended upwards to render this conscious. This is the part that's actually unconscious. Sorry. <laughs> Big mistake. You know, and I, as you heard in the introduction, I mean, I'm a Freudian and I've devoted my life to the study of Freud and the translation of Freud and God knows I understand Freud and I love Freud, but Freud made a whopper of a mistake here. And uh, it's taken me a while to accept it, but you know, the more I think it through, the more I realize this is the only way to make sense of it. Let me give you just one tiny example. Actually, I'll give you two. The small one is Freud said affects can't be unconscious. I, I, I don't know how many of you remember that Freud repeatedly said affect is by definition conscious. It's an oxymoron to speak of an unconscious feeling because feelings are felt. You know, you can't feel something without feeling it. Um, therefore, feelings, emotions, affects are always conscious. That's what the word means. Uh, Freud also said the id the id Feelings of pleasure and unpleasure govern the passage of events in the id with despotic force. The id obeys the inexorable pleasure principle. So feelings, feelings of pleasure and unpleasure govern the passage of events in the id with despotic force. The id obeys the pleasure principle. Well, how can the id be unconscious? How, I mean, did you see what I mean? When, when I realized this mistake, a whole lot of things fell into place and actually made much better sense than they ever did before. And here's one of them. The pleasure principle, which is a bottom-up principle, that has to involve feelings. And if the pleasure principle regulates what goes on in the id, the id has to have feeling. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. You know, it's, it's, it's a completely massive contradiction to say what Freud says there and at the same time say that the id is unconscious. The only way in which you could make it work uh, otherwise would be to say um, that, in fact, uh, the, the id, uh, all these unconscious drive derivative thingies are unconscious and then they register feelings up here in the green part and then the feelings have to be dragged down here and then they regulate the passage of events in the id. And uh, that's a nonsense because that would make the pleasure principle a top-down regulatory principle, which it's not. It's a bottom-up uh, principle, a bottom-up motivational principle which is regulated by the reality principle from above. And in fact, the thing I've just said about uh, Freud would have to say that the feelings are felt up there, and then he actually does say that um, in, a, in, a, in another paper that I'm not quoting here on the screen. If you read my paper on the conscious id, you'll see Freud really did actually try to do that, which is a whole, actually just doing the same thing as what Magoon and Maruzzi did, which is fudging it. You know, trying to somehow make the facts fit into a theory which uh, they don't fit into. So, uh, I conclude this part of my talk by telling you the id is conscious, no question about it. The ego is unconscious, and that has big implications for our field and for what we do. Sip of water. This is not for dramatic effect. <laughs> and I'll move on. Here's my argument. We have, as I said, spent most of our time on this first point because I had to be sure that you got that before I could go on. And I want to speak about homeostasis 
the pleasure and pleasure uh, uh, principle and the nirvana principle. I want to go back to what I said earlier, just make sure that you've got it, but I now want to elaborate it uh, slightly. The way in which, uh, by the way, homeostasis was discovered or invented as a concept in the 1930s by Cannon. Freud didn't know about homeostasis. Freud had his own version of it, the constancy principle and all of that, but he didn't, and homeostasis didn't exist uh, as a concept. So it's quite you know, a, a, a thing to, to recognize that. This is how homeostasis works, and I've already told you this, except now I'm going to make some aspect of it more clear. There's a set point. That is the ideal in regard to all of these bodily parameters. And then there's a range around that set point which is compatible with life, and then you fall off the cliff. So when you deviate from the set point in either direction, uh, too much or too little um, temperature, for example, too hot or too cold, uh, it starts to feel unpleasant. unpleasant. That's the unpleasure that I spoke of earlier. And please note, the feeling of unpleasure and this is the theory of Damasio that I've already um, enunciated for you, that, that, that's what the feeling is for. The feeling makes you aware, this is dangerous, I'm deviating from the homeostatic set point in the wrong direction. Um, this, this feels bad. This is bad for my survival or reproductive success. And that motivates the organism to do stuff in the outside world so that you can find the thing that you need, in this case, a, a different ambient a temperature environment, so that you can either warm up or cool down, depending on how, which direction you've deviated from the set point in. That feels pleasurable. As you move back, back into the range, back to, closer toward the set point, you feel pleasure. That motivates you to carry on doing this. You're on the right track. You're getting hotter. It's good. You know? And then, bing, you reach the set point, And what happens then? Feeling stops. That's the important point you've got to understand. So the set point is ideal. That's what the organism wants. It doesn't need to feel anything until you deviate from it. That deviation from the set point is a feeling of unpleasure. And the moving back to the set point is the feeling of pleasure. Once you get back to the set point, there's no feeling required anymore. You see how that works in relation to the, 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 the theory of consciousness that I've, that I've, that I've described for you. By the way, I want to also make clear that this is what Freud means by drive. Freud said a drive, of, well, he strangely translated it instinct, which is a bad uh, translation, by the way. The German word that Freud used is trieb, which means drive. So, and Freud says a trieb, a drive, is a measure of the demand made upon the mind to perform work. And that's what I've just described to you. The deviation from the set point is the drive. The further you move from the set point, the stronger the drive pressure. You know, this is, this is what, exactly what we mean by drive in neurobiology. But the thing that I'm adding is that the way in which you become aware of the drive is through feeling. In fact, the feeling is the subjective state of the drive. The being, the, the organism feels, knows about the deviation from, from the homeostatic point a set point by dint of unpleasurable feelings and movements back to it, pleasurable feelings. That's why the pleasure-unpleasure principle governs the passage of events in the id, that is the drive-driven part of the mind, um, and that's why it has to be conscious. Uh, and that's what feelings are for, as I've said to you. And remember, that's the only piece of theory in everything that I'm saying to you. The rest of it is simple fact. So, what you need to see is here we have the explanation for Freud's famous Nirvana principle told you, it's really nice, you know, the thing is, once you realize how the thing works, once we've reconfigured the basic Freudian model in line with these other um, uh, sources of information about how the apparatus works, so much falls into place in such a neat and satisfying way, that's a measure of a good theory. So, the pleasure-unpleasure principle that Freud spoke of, and the Nirvana principle, which gave him so much trouble, here we have a simple, non-spooky, death-drivey kind of weird thing. You know, we have a very simple homeostatic principle, and in, in relation to feelings, that's what feelings are for. You only, feelings mean, I mean, a state of need, unpleasurable feelings. They're a problem. They represent a problem for the survival and reproductive success of the organism. And pleasure means, yes, it's a motivational, both of them are motivational uh, uh, um, uh, principles uh, for getting you back to the set point. When you're at the set point, there's no feeling anymore. You're a zombie. That's the Nirvana principle. That's what we're aspiring to, please note. This is what Freud said, you know, that ultimately what we're aspiring to is nothingness. Well, here's why. 
Do you get it? Okay, good. So now I can move on to point three. So, as you know, uh, Freud said that drives have a source, an aim, and an object. The source of the drive is the internal bodily economy that I've spoken of, and the object is this reason why life is difficult. As I told you, you've got to find things in the outside world that will, that will remove the need, the, the remove the source of the drive. And so you've got to go and find an object, and you've got to, the finding of it and the doing stuff with the object um, is how you remove the source, how you, how you reduce the demand on the mind to perform work. So that's this famous old Freudian drive theory, source, aim, object. What I want to make clear is that the aim and the object uh, refers to the external world. So what comes in through the external senses is finding of the object, and you have to learn which object is going to meet this need, and uh, that's what the ego is for. There are some instinctual ones. I've told, I showed you that on my, on my diagram of the brain. Uh, there are some instinctual ones which are built in. The way that they work is, if you have this sort of feeling which is a problem, you know, then this is what you do. There's an automatic built-in aim and object. Uh, that's what makes it an instinct. So, for example, separation distress. <coughs> There's an attachment need. Uh, you are in trouble if you're a mammal and you're a little mammal and you are separated from the source of the nourishment that us mammals all need to get from somebody else. Um, uh, juvenile mammals. So there's an unpleasant feeling. That's called separation distress, also known as panic anxiety. And then there's a certain kind of behavior that that triggers, which is an automatic prediction of aim and object, which is, I need mummy, and what do I do? I go, mummy, you lost it, me! And I wander around looking for her. You know, that's called protest behavior, and that's seeking reunion with the object. That's how all drives and instincts work. Please note there's a source. Deviation, uh, the source of the drive is a measure of the demand, a measure of the deviation from the set point. In this case, I want to be with money. Uh, the deviation is felt as unpleasure. In this case, the variety of unpleasure known as panic or separation distress. And that triggers a behavior which is the aim and object of the, of the instinct. I, I want to be reunited with money. And that's what you do. So I'm uh, reiterating all of this about instincts in order to make this point, that learning does the same thing. And you have to learn. You know, it's very good that we have instincts. I'm very grateful to God for giving us instincts, for giving me instincts, so that you don't have to learn everything. For example, you know, if you were a little um, instinctless mammal and you come to a cliff face, uh, what would you do? You'd think, well, let me learn what will happen if I jump off this. And of course you will learn exactly what will happen and it'll be the only thing you ever learn and then you're gone. So those of our ancestors, or perhaps I should say our non-ancestors, um, the, 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 those of uh, the, 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 the ancients, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 those millions of years, millions and hundreds of millions of years ago, the types who thought, let's see what happens if we jump off cliff faces, they got removed from the gene pool. And uh, those who had an innate tendency to withdraw from cliff faces and to feel uh, uh, fear anxiety, which is a different type of anxiety, a different circuit, what you, and it, there's a prediction what you should do if you feel fear. The prediction is you must freeze or you must flee. This, this is uh, how, how the fear instinct works. That's how all instincts work. They're built into our brains. We know automatically what to do in, in response to those feelings. Remember all the time in everything I'm saying, a feeling represents a problem. The problem is, you know, I need something, that's what the feeling means, and then you have to do something to get rid of the feeling so that you can get back to the state of nirvana, uh, which means this is where you survive and reproduce, stay there, mate. Um, but as instincts, nice as they are, don't begin to do justice to the unpredictable complexities of the actual environmental niche that you find yourself in. So it's nice that we have a few tools for living that are inbuilt, but then you have to add to those. And that is what the ego is for. So it receives information from the outside world, it internalizes that information. That is to say, you learn how to meet your needs in the world over and above these instincts. So it's a kind of an elaboration of instinct. That's what learning is. And it's really as simple as that. So the reality principle, that is to say, the fabric, the remembered internalized fabric of how the world works, which constitutes our ego, is a, 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 an elaboration of what the id has already provided. So now you have to learn for yourself 
about the environment that we actually find ourselves in, like, for example, electric sockets. You know, when the mammalian brain was designed 200 million years ago, there were no electric sockets. They are things you shouldn't stick your finger into, you should fear them. But there's no instinct that tells you that. You know, you can have an instinct for fear, but you have to learn what to fear. And this is, this is what I mean. And then it gets much more complex than that. There also are things, you know, which are not, which fear or panic or um, lust won't deal with by themselves. There are all kinds of nuances and elaborations and amalgamations of these things. And this is what the ego does. But the crucial point I want to make is this. That the aim of learning is to have a prediction, to, not an instinctual one, this is a learned prediction. How do I meet my needs in the world? over and above what is instinctually given. So it works exactly the same way as the instincts in this sense, that I now, when I find myself in this situation, which I've learnt about, I know what to do. I have a prediction that is the aim and the object. It's built in. I know what I have to do. When I have this feeling, I do that, and this is what takes the feeling away. You see, that's what all learning is for. Once you've learnt how to do something, you automatise it. You know, this is the solution to this problem. That's, the learning is how, how do I meet my needs in the world and what regulates learning is feelings. That's the value system that tells you, you know, what's working and what's not working. Once it's resolved, then you have an automatized aim and object, you know what to do, and the feelings are no longer required. The point I'm leading up to is this, that this is why the ego is intrinsically unconscious in the sense that the ego, all learning is aiming for nirvana. It's aiming for a set point where I know what to do. Feelings are problems. We don't want feelings. Feelings are problems. That means you're not there yet, mate. You know, when you get there, you have zombie So the, 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 the getting back to the homeostatic set point, now elaborated by learning, ultimately leads you to a state of non-consciousness. The feelings come from below, from the id, from the needs not being met. The, the, the deviations, the demands upon the mind to perform work. So what the whole cognitive machinery is there for is to get rid of the feelings, to contain, manage, reduce the feelings. Um, the feelings are the problem that the cognition is there to solve. So the ego is trying to render the id unconscious. Do you see what I mean? That's how it works. It's exactly how it works. Um, okay, so now I'm on point four. So now I'm referring to another theorist that's well worth acquainting yourself with. I've mentioned Jacques Panksef and I've mentioned Antonio Damasio. Now um, I'm mentioning Carl Friston, F-R-I-S-T-O-N. Fabulous computational neuroscientist based in London. And he conceptualizes exactly what I've just told you in beautiful mathematical terms, uh, incidentally all based upon Helmholtzian principles. So he he's, he's, he's derives his theorizing from the same tradition that Freud did. Hermann von Helmholtz and the whole you know th theory of thermodynamics and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, 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 Friston's working in that same tradition, and what Friston says is that the way that cognition works is that it is the whole, the whole of what Freud calls the reality principle, the ego. What it is is a prediction machine. That all learning is to establish predictions to learn. What do I have to do to get rid of the feeling in order to meet my needs in the world? That's what, that's what cognition is for, and that's why he calls it a prediction machine. And how you know that you are, uh, things aren't working is when there are feelings. Feelings, uh, 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 Friston calls them prediction errors. And he also, in this whole Helmholtzian thing, I don't want to go into all of that, but he says that then the energy is unbound and there's free energy released in the system. Uh, that means there's an increase in entropy. The increase in entropy is the affect. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, this is prediction error. That the feeling tells you this isn't working, and then you've got to correct the prediction. That is to say you've got to update your prediction. You've got to update your con cognition. Uh, in order to learn how to, to revise what, because your prediction didn't work, now you've updated it and now you know how to deal with this situation. Once you've learned how to deal with it, you've got a new prediction, and then there is, you're back at the homeostatic set point again, and it is automatized. So it only gets de-automatized when it doesn't work. Uh, uh, this is, this is how, how all of cognition works. I wanted to point out that things that are salient, objects in the world which attract our attention, are things which matter to us in terms of this biological scale of values. So you only pay attention to things, that is to say render them conscious, when, they, when they're a problem, when it isn't working the way you expected. 
So uh, uh, consciousness has to do with uncertainty, with surprise, uh, uh, Friston calls it, attention, salience. Now you've got to pay attention to this. You've got to feel something about that. You've got to feel your way through your cognitions again, because now you've got a problem. You've got to work out, does this work? Does this work? No, that works. Okay, good, bingo. Now uh, I've got a new prediction. That's how it all works. And I wanted to make the point that that's what reality testing, what we call reality testing, is also all about. You can have a fantasy about how things work, you know, but if it doesn't actually remove the source of the, of the, of the demand upon the mind, uh, then it's not going to uh, get rid of the feelings. The feelings will remain. That is to say, there's still a problem. So it's only when you really actually have, uh, if your prediction uh, is correct and it actually does remove the source of the, of the drive demand, uh, only then um, have you a realistic prediction. And so reality, reality testing is the same thing as what Friston calls prediction error or minimization of prediction error. Okay, um, I'm going to move on. Um, wow. Okay, so um, I just want to quickly point out that there are three varieties of consciousness. I'm not going to dwell on this because I really need to make these, these, these additional points before my time runs out. The three varieties of consciousness, uh, Freud spoke of consciousness as if it was one thing, and this leads to confusion. So I want to update uh, the, 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 the meaning of the word consciousness. All consciousness theorists distinguish between two aspects of conscious, consciousness nowadays. We speak of, um, of, of pre-reflective consciousness and reflective consciousness, or of primary consciousness and secondary consciousness. That is to say, raw phenomenal consciousness and access consciousness, or awareness of your consciousness. Higher order thoughts about pr primary raw crude conscious experience. That's with various t uh, words, various uh, uh, names for it, Consciousness theorists distinguish between these two aspects of external consciousness. I want to make this point to clarify. When Freud speaks of consciousness, he's speaking about this aspect, secondary consciousness, reflective consciousness. When Freud says what we're aiming for in psychoanalysis is to make the unconscious conscious, what he means is we want to be aware of our consciousness. We want to think about our consciousness. That's the kind of consciousness that Freud's talking about, this kind it's crude consciousness. It's like hallucinatory consciousness or psychotic consciousness. It's also consciousness, but it's just, bleh, you know, feeling about. This is the thing of, oh, I am feeling this about that, and this is why, and so on. You know, that's, that's what Freud aspires for, or, or, or um, encourages us to aspire to. Uh, so it's very important to distinguish those two aspects of consciousness, and I want to clarify that when Freud speaks of thing presentations versus word presentations, um, this type of consciousness is attached to thing presentations. This type of consciousness is attached to word presentations. Words enable you to abstract yourself from that there is symbolic re-representation, and it enables you to get outside of the two persons, the, 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 the second person sort of you, it, and be able to think, oh, I too am an object from the point of view of that object. I'm a subject to me, but I'm not. In all of that kind of thinking about yourself and your feelings in relation to objects, that's secondary consciousness. But as you see, there's three aspects to consciousness, and I want to point out to remind you what the third aspect is, which is feeling. Emotional consciousness is not extra-receptive. Emotional consciousness is interoceptive. It's about the state of the subject. And that's the primary form of consciousness. So there's primary affective consciousness. Then there's secondarily affective consciousness applied to object representations, which is this, you know, I feel like this about that. And then there's this third aspect of consciousness, which is thinking about how you're feeling about that. <coughs> and uh, these three aspects of consciousness need to be differentiated from each other. If we bring that into our theory, we'll, we'll, we'll have a lot less uh, confusion about what consciousness is, um, a la Freud. Okay, now we come to point six, to thinking. So, I, I hope it's clear what thinking is. Thinking is problem solving with consciousness. Uh, it's, it's, you need consciousness to solve the problem because you need, to, you need to have some value system which says what is success and what is failure. So when you've got a situation where you don't know what to do, uh, you have to feel your way through it. Uh, this is what I mean by thinking. And thinking, the value of thinking as opposed to doing, is that you can do it in the virtual reality of your mind. That is of your ego. That is of this representational expanse of cortex. So thinking is virtual acting 
in your mind, inhibited acting, thinking through the problem with what Freud called signal affects, telling you, you know, how you're doing. And once you've thought your way through the problem, then you don't need to think anymore. I've told you this part already. So thinking consciously is a temporary state that we tolerate. You know, until we've solved the problem, then we automatize it. Uh, automatize the prediction because now the problem is solved. Um, that's what thinking is. Thinking exists in Freudian theory. You can see how it's an inhibition of action. The, the instinct wants us to act automatically, primary process. A secondary process is this delay, this inhibition of action, and there thinking happens. And the aim of thinking is to get back to the primary process, to automaticity. So it's, the, it's a tolerated, frustrated, um, having to think your way through a problem, and you need feelings for it, which is why they're conscious. And the contemporary term for this is working memory. Now, I want to make a point about working memory. Those of you who are neuropsychologists will know this very well. Working memory, that is to say, conscious thinking, is a very small place. Uh, it is an extremely limited resource. You are able to hold in consciousness, that is to say, hold in working memory, that is to say, hold in mind these mental billiard balls that you try to you know, uh, uh, sink into the pockets correctly, uh, the solving of a problem in consciousness, you can only hold seven billiard boards, balls in mind at any one point in time. The, 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 the normal human, the, the extent of normal human working memory is seven bits of information, big, plus or minus one. Now think about how much information there is that you've got to contend with, you know, and how much information you have contended with in your past, and then you know, think of seven in relation to that number, and you get some sense of how small working memory, that is conscious thinking, is. It is minute, and it's a limited resource, and therefore it is precious. So this is what I say when I what I mean when I say that we tolerate conscious thinking. It's also, you know, we have to, it's not only that we want to automatize everything as soon as we can, we have to automatize everything as soon as we can because we've got so little space for thinking about things, for feeling our way through problems consciously. So that's an important point about thinking, and that leads me to point seven, which is the main uh, additional thing that I have to say, and I think I've got about five minutes. Is, is that how you want me to do it? Five, ten? Great, thank you, I love you. <laughs> My problem has, uh, the pleasure has just, uh, the problem has, has just, um, So, the, um, the way that it works is this. Now I'm speaking as a cognitive neuroscientist. We have conscious problem solving going on in working memory. Once we've solved the problem, we automatize the prediction. Why? Because we've got to get on to solve the next problem. Because heaven knows life is full of unpredictable and unexpected events all the time. You know, so you're constantly having to deal with new unexpected situations. They cause surprise, they prediction error, they, they cause feeling, that salience, you pay attention, think your way through the thing, good, done that, okay, done that, okay, now done that. And you know, this is, as I said, why life is difficult, so like, now I've done that one, and now I can move on to the next one, and another problem, and another problem. That's a, in this little, little bottleneck called your working memory. And everything's getting shunted down into the unconscious. The unconscious is the automatized predictions. Okay, that's what cognitive science teaches us. So this, as you know, the, uh, was rediscovered uh, in the 80s and the 90s. Cognitive scientists said, guess what, you know, the, most of the mind is unconscious. And we said, yo, we knew that all along, you know, us Freudians. And they said, no, 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 we're not talking about your unconscious. We've got a cognitive unconscious. And it works the way that I've just described to you. So now, here is my next point. How are we psychoanalysts? to make sense of our unconscious in relation to everything that I've just described to you. I believe that it works like this. Because consciousness in the sense of working memory, conscious thinking, problem solving, is such a limited place, you have to move on. You have to shunt things down into the unconscious as soon as you possibly can. As soon as you've solved the problem, you automatize the prediction so that you can pay attention to the next thing that really deserves it. So you feel your way through that thing. What do you do if you can't solve the problem? Do you spend the rest of your life pondering that problem? You know, your little seven bits of information are going to be the same little seven bits of information forevermore until you die. You know, imagine that. Not exactly expedient. So what do you do? Well, you make the best of a bad job. Okay? You sort of say, shit, I can't solve this problem. I'm automatizing my solution, even though it doesn't work. 
even though I haven't solved this problem, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to behave as if I have. And I'm going to make a prediction, and I'm going to automatize that prediction, even though it doesn't work, and I'm going to get on with the next thing, because you know, I can't solve this one. That is the Freudian unconscious. The repressed is, works in exactly the same way as the cognitive unconscious. It's an automatization of predictions, except it's a premature or illegitimate automatization of predictions. That's the dynamic unconscious. Why is it dynamic? Because it's going to lead to endless prediction errors. You can keep on banging into reality, and you're going to keep applying your non-solution to it, and what's that going to do? It differs from the cognitive unconscious in that it's going to cause you feelings. Okay? That's prediction error. Entropy. Uh, uh, surprise. This, gosh, you know, I've got a problem here. Except you won't know what the problem's about. Because you've automatized your solution, your non-solution. That is what Freud called the threat of the return of the repressed. So, you're going to, you're going to have all these feelings about... Uh, you, the, 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 the reality that you're banging into uh, because your prediction as to how reality works isn't how it works, but you don't know that because you've automatized it. And there's enormous pressure to automatize. I've told you why. That's what we mean by resistance. You can't reverse the flow without you know, going against the whole design of the apparatus. It's a very important point. I want to illustrate this, even though I'm running out of time, you know, just, I don't want to get too lost in abstractions. The, the, the unconscious in our sense of the word. The repressed works like this. Imagine, I'm a four-year-old Mark Solms, and I think, I want to be big. Because, yeah? I mean, who doesn't? So you four, how do you make yourself big? Yeah? No, it doesn't work. You know? I want to be big now. It doesn't work. There's your dad. You know? I want to be big like him. I want to drive a car. I want to have a job. You know, I mean, for heaven's sake, I want it. Now! How do you solve that problem when you're four years old? Yeah. I want to be married. I want to be married to her. <laughs> I want to make babies. I want to have children. I don't want to just be a child. You know, I want to, yeah, etc. There you have the Oedipus complex. Okay? And what do you do? You've got to repress it. Because you can't solve it. It doesn't work. There's no solution to it. And that is why, in the unconscious, we have so many conflicts. A conflict you know, is an insoluble problem. And so, there you have some simple pointers as to how repression works and what the unconscious is. Freud said that the unconscious has four special characteristics. Uh, firstly, he said it's timeless. Well, all the unconscious is timeless. The cognitive unconscious is timeless too. What it means is, I've got a prediction, and now I apply that forevermore. Okay, so you don't update it. It's, it's, a, it's an automatized prediction stuck down there. That's why it's timeless. Uh, Freud said that it tolerates mutual contradiction. Well, that's what I've just said. The repressed part of the unconscious is mutual contradiction. You know, mutual contradictions are things that you've got to solve, except these ones aren't solved. That's the repressed part of the unconscious. Freud said that in the unconscious, internal reality predominates over external reality. That's just another way of saying what I've told you that your predictions are there uh, and not being corrected by errors. You know, they're, they're not being updated. That means that the internal predictive model is predominating over the, 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 the um, contradictory sensory uh, information. And Freud said that the primary process operates in the unconscious. Well, that's what I mean by aut automatization. All of the unconscious operates by primary processes. It's, uh, it's um, aiming to reduce cognition to function in the same way as instincts did. So that without this delay, without this uh, tolerating of the frustration that I've spoken of. So there you have the unconscious. Now I move on to point eight. Obviously I have a lot more to say, but I need to finish. And point eight is, is an important one. Freud famously said, hysterics suffer mainly from reminiscences. And uh, I'd like to rephrase that and say, our patients suffer mainly from feelings. And I hope you can see why. Our patients don't come and say, um, Doctor, there's something I'm unconscious of. Can you please tell me what it is? <laughs> they say, uh, Doctor, I've got these feelings. Will you please take them away? You know, I don't know where they come from. I don't want them. They don't make any sense to me. That's why our patients come to psychoanalytical therapy. And I think that that's a very important point. It sounds like a little silly uh, uh, um, truism. But it's really important to understand conceptually what we're dealing with. Our patients are coming to us with feelings 
and they're doing stuff in the world that doesn't work, which is causing them these feelings, and they don't know what the stuff is that they're doing and how it relates to, because it's unconscious, it's automatized, and they don't know how it relates to these feelings. So that is our psychoanalytical task. The psychoanalytical task is to try to understand why is there this feeling? And what is the unconscious prediction, the error, the, 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 the prematurely or illegitimately automatized prediction that's generating these feelings? That's really what we're doing in psychoanalysis. Trying to find the ideas that belong with these feelings. That's the task of psychoanalysis. Um, now, um, it's not easy to do that because the automatized uh, the prediction is unconscious and has to be slowly and against great resistances brought back into feeling which is unpleasurable. And the whole of psychoanalysis, in my view, is what we've learned about how to help patients to do that. How to help patients to, to re-problematize their, their uh, 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 repressed predict, uh, predictions which don't really work. To update them. And that we call in neuroscience reconsolidation. And there's a fabulous opportunity for our field, as we've understood at the cellular level, what, what reconsolidation is. Reconsolidation is you have a stabilized, long-term potentiated trace. This is what I do. This happens, I do that. This happens, I do that. It's associative. It's automatic. And when it doesn't work, there's a prediction error. Then the thing has to be activated into consciousness. It has to be rendered labile. So at the cellular level, the, the stabilized trace becomes labile again. And that happens by feeling, that is to say, by the thing being activated. And it's by burst firing from reticulous cells, if you think back to the picture I showed you. That's how reconsolidation works. You have to, you have to feel, you have to re-problematize the trace, think your way through it again, and then consolidate it differently. That's what learning is. And that's what we're aiming to do in psychoanalysis. And the, the fact that we now have... The, the beginnings of a cellular level of understanding of all of that is just fantastic. Um, as you can see, I'm, uh, my problem has now come home to roost, and uh, I don't have time to tell you about transference and reconsolidation, except the little bit I told you about. Unconscious communication, counter-transference, projection and introjection. I'll tell you about all of that another time, hopefully later on today. Thanks very much. some of you to come up and ask specific questions and quietly what we'd like to really be able to aim for is start the afternoon part by 12.15. So, uh, but I also know everybody wants to ask a lot. So what we are going to do is maybe ask about 10 to 15 minutes of questionings and then ask you to go up to the back, get your food and come back and sit down and well, why start. Why don't we do both at the same time? We can do both. I don't want to interfere with you. But I, those of you who feel that you'd like to start to collect your lunch, please do so then. That's a good idea. And anyone who would like to come up and ask a specific question, will we have a, a mic. Um, I'm going to start with Dr. Aaron. For, uh, I'll just start by saying what, what a spectacular lecturer you are. Thank you so much. So clear. I, I, I just have some questions to clarify. Yes. But, but before, before we hear the, the question, I want to tell you, I always get alarmed when people start off by saying how something, uh, there's always a but. No know. but. Just pure clarification. Okay, good. On the question of the feelings, it seemed to me you were saying as you move away from the set point, you feel the feeling is a negative feeling. Um, and then you emphasize that you, the, the wish to return to the nirvana principle, the wish, the wish to return to the set point. But I, I just wanted you to clarify what then is the place, or how do you think about positive feelings? Because you also talk about part of the brain where there's just total pleasure, orgasmic, positive feelings. Is it just, the question is, is it just the wish to get rid of feelings, which is the way I thought you put it at one point, yeah. or is, is there a separate wish to have the positive feelings? If, if I can, just one more clarification. The way you 
presented Freud's error, that the id was unconscious. And I know you went over this very quickly, but when you were talking about the different kinds of consciousness, would it still, would you still think of it as an error if you understood what he meant by unconscious at that point as not reflective consciousness? In other words, could it be that what he meant about the id was that it was not reflectively conscious and that he wasn't referring to whether there was consciousness in, in the primary sense? So just want to understand your, your, the critique of him on that. Okay, so let me start with your second point first. Um, the, the id is affective consciousness. So, you know, there's, there's a, it's a very big difference, affective consciousness and unconsciousness. But I want to tell you that this is a mistake that many cognitive scientists make, uh, including cognitive scientists doing research on the unconscious, uh, including subliminal perception work, for example. They behave as if because you haven't cognitively, you don't have a cognitive consciousness of the stimulus, you don't know what word you read, therefore it's unconscious. But in fact, the experimental subject has a feeling. Um, and so the, the, there's still valence consciousness there. It's only the cognitive aspect of consciousness that's unconscious. And that's a terribly important distinction. So you're right to say, you know, well, we, we can be lenient on Freud because, you know, he's in very good company when he makes this mistake. But I do need to make clear that the id is not unconscious. The id is cognitively unconscious, but it is affectively conscious. And that's why I, I, I distinguish these three grades of consciousness. Um, the id theoretically could become unconscious if everything was working absolutely perfectly. That's the nirvana principle, which the id do aspires to. Everyone aspires to nirvana, um, ego and id, um, and all of us. Uh, but you never ever get there, uh, because life is absolutely full of, unpre of unpredictable, uncertain, insoluble you know, things that we're having to deal with all the time. And our needs, the demands coming from the internal milieu, are also relentless. So, in fact, the id is... The de facto, it is conscious, it is affectively conscious. Um, the ego is intrinsically unconscious. Uh, it's representational work, all of the cognitive work that it's doing, which is the vast bulk of it, is unconscious. And Baj and Chartrand uh, summarized the, the conscious, unconscious thing from a cognitive point of view, and they said 95% of our voluntary acts, of our, you know, of our, of our motivated uh, 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 cognitions, are unconscious. I think it's a gross exaggeration. 95, it's more like 99.999 are unconscious, you know, because as I said, we know that uh, how very, very, very small consciousness is. So most of what the ego does is unconscious. I've already said most of what the id does is conscious in the affective sense. Most of what the ego does is unconscious in the cognitive sense. Um, there's a little bit of it that's conscious, and that's the bit that is currently being activated from below by the id. So the affect uh, colors the cognitions and makes them into conscious cognition, and then there's two varieties of that. So um, I think that when Freud says that the ego is conscious, what he means is a tiny, tiny fragment of it is conscious, and then those two aspects of consciousness apply. But still, I think that we have to emphasize the point that the consciousness is derived from the id. So it's, it's, it still is a really big mistake. Um, now to your first point. Um, and thank you for your first point, because I think this is a common source of, of, of uh, confusion. No, I'm not saying that feelings are always unpleasant. Of course, they are pleasant feelings. Um, the way it works is the set point is in the middle, that's no feeling. That means no problem. That means it's ideal, this is, this is how you meet your needs and it's working perfectly. Deviations away from the set point are unpleasant. And movements back to the set point are pleasant. When you get to the set point, the pleasure stops. So that's satiety, if you want. You know, if you think about your own sexual life, if I may mention it for a moment, you, know, you don't just carry on and on and on and on, having orgasms after orgasms. Eventually, there's like fuck enough already. You know, and uh, you know, you're there, you're satisfied. So and the same applies to eating and drinking and everything. You know, so yes, there's as much pleasure as the is unpleasure, but feelings always mean you're not yet at the ideal state. You haven't yet reached the set point. It just the pleasure and unpleasure have to do with the direction as to moving away from it or moving towards it. Then secondly, it's important to recognize that there are varieties of pleasure and unpleasure. So Freud thought there was a single pleasure-unpleasure principle. And there's, there's one um, um, sort of uh, um, continuum. At this end there's pleasure, at this end there's unpleasure. Uh, it's not like that. There's a center, which is nothingness, and then there are 
unpleasures and pleasures, and then there are many different ones, so that there is a specific separate mechanism in the brain for feeling thirst. And the feeling of thirst is a variety of unpleasure which is quite different from the feeling of hunger, which is another variety of unpleasure which is different from the feeling of sexual desire, you know, which is a etc, etc, sexual frustration. And conversely, the satisfaction of those is a variety of pleasure. So, but that's, I'm speaking there about homeostatic drives, which are really very basic, simple emotions. There are much more complex ones, like the one I've referred to so often today, separation distress. That's a panicky feeling, that's unpleasure, and then there's the feeling of safety, you know, as you come back again. And so, and you could say, uh, for um, um, uh, rage, you know, it's another variety of unpleasure. This thing is in my way. Uh, that causes rage, that's the, 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 the particular variety of unpleasure we're talking about there. I get rid of the bastard is the prediction as to what you're supposed to do when you have this feeling. And then, you know, you, you, it's, it's pleasurable and then you get back to the set point and then rage is no longer registering on the radar screen. That's how it works. But I think it's very important for getting beyond all sorts of complications that Freud got himself into. Freud was in a total mess about how do we relate feelings of pleasure and unpleasure to drive tension. You know, and as you know, at the end, Freud gave up on the thing and he said, well, they don't seem to relate in any direct way. And that's because of this thinking that it's one continuum, uh, thinking that it works from pleasure to unpleasure on a continuum, and not recognizing that there are varieties of pleasure and unpleasure, and that, and that, and that uh, 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 getting rid of, uh, or, or getting away from unpleasure and, and moving to pleasure um, are different things from the Nirvana state. Mm. <laughs> you are so Mark. Is that you, Mark? Yes. Hi. And then you will absolutely have to ask questions I think this works very well. Let's do it like this. Yeah. Uh, it was really an excellent talk, Mark. I'm one of the people who came yesterday, and I came back again today, and I'm very glad I did. Uh, but uh, I guess, I, it, I, having heard this talk twice now, I, I'm wondering, it's a wonderful model, except I don't see the place in the model for unconscious affect. And there's a lot of work on unconscious affect that Drew Wesson has done, and I think many of us who are clinicians see patients who don't come in and say, I know it, I'm having all these bad feelings. Some patients come in and they don't know what they feel. And so I don't see how unconscious affect into this model. Okay, first of all, I want to remind you um, that according to Freud, there is no such thing as unconscious affect. And this really it can degenerate into a semantic discussion as to what you mean by affect. So I want to be clear that what I mean by affect is a feeling state. You know, and that's if you think about the role that affect plays in the mental apparatus, you know, that's what feelings are for. Feelings are so that you can know, I'm, you know that's why you have them. Uh, 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 Invertebrates who don't have a, an uh, upper uh, brainstem and a reticular activating system have is absolutely automatic, pre-programmed. This is what you do in this situation. It's 100% predicted by the um, um, uh, hard wiring. The, the, think of the leap, the, the evolutionary advantage of being able to think, feel for yourself. You know, in real time. You know, what, what, what works best. You know, let, let me try this out. Let me try that out. The flexibility and adaptability that comes with that is enormous. So affect means this additional thing which you feel. That's why we feel at all, and that's what consciousness is there for. And that's how I see it, that's how Freud saw it. Unconscious feeling doesn't exist. Now, you're saying, well, we clinicians know it does exist, and many of our patients, uh, so let me tell you what I think you're describing. You're describing, actually, a cognition that is unconscious. Uh, the patient doesn't know that, why they're feeling, or even that they're feeling. And let me explain something here. It comes up at the end of my talk, which I didn't get to. You have patients. Uh, what, what, I, what I believe is our patients come to us, and in fact, now I'm able to go through some of these things. Great, Mark, thank you. Look. So we come, the patients come in, and Freud tells us we must, we must tune our unconscious toward our patient's unconscious, and then you know, we'll sort of like pick up by some kind of spooky way uh, you know, what's, our unconscious directly picks up what's going I don't think that's how it works. I think that what, what Kleinians call countertransference, the modern usage of the word countertransference, the patient comes in and you feel something. 
You know, you feel, and that's conscious. You feel something, but you don't know what this feeling is about. You don't know what it means. And the analytic task is then to try and understand what does this feeling mean. Now, that feeling isn't an unconscious affect. It's an affect, the meaning of which is unconscious. And the patient doesn't even have to know that they're having it. That comes to this point at the bottom about psychotic and other more primitive states. A patient might come into the consulting room having a feeling which they think is in you, or you know, which they think is in the policeman on the corner, you know, and, and so on. So the, the misconstrual of affect, and remember the main thing that the ego does with feelings is it objectifies them. That's the whole design of the apparatus is I've got a feeling, I have to head to objects. Objects are where I deal with feelings. And so as soon as you can f attach the feeling to a representation, you've done the first job of work of meeting, the, of, of dealing with the need that lies behind the feeling, of being able to deal with the thing that's gone wrong. The, uh, you have to head toward objects. Object representations and cognitions, they manage and contain the feelings. They're our only hope as to how we're going to get beyond the feelings. And you can have very primitive cognitions, that's this thing presentation type of, of, of consciousness, which isn't actually realistic, like primary narcissism also. It's like you can think that everything that feels good is me and everything that feels bad is not me, but it ain't necessarily so. And so in, in a patient in that kind of state, they might not know that they have a feeling at all. In fact, what they think is that you're a bastard. You know? And so that's where the, the feeling that they're not having is located for them. So when we speak of an unconscious affect, I think what we mean is that the, the, the representations that make sense of where this, what this affect is are not conscious. And that can even mean the representation of, of self versus object, that the, 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 the affect might be mislocated by the patient. Um, like I said in the example of a paranoid schizophrenic who thinks that, that there's this bizarre object over there that's doing something. Um, is, that is in fact a feeling, and, and our job is to unpick that thing. So it, it, to say it again in, in, in a much simpler way, I don't believe there are unconscious affects. Affects by definition are conscious, uh, but the cognitions that belong with them are easily rendered unconscious, and uh, the, the, the explanation of where the feeling belongs and what it means and what it's all about only can be found through the rendering of the cognitions conscious. And I think that's what we mean by an unconscious affect. I'd like to say that just people are commenting, we have asked to have the air conditioning turned off about three times. They assure us it's been taken care of. We are aware it's cold. I apologize. It's colder in the back, I believe, than it is up front. It's not cold up here, in case anyone yeah. wants that. Um, what we're going to do is this, um, Mark, because we would like to give you about 15 minutes to have something to eat. <laughs> uh, we Where don't... is that voice? Oh, there you are. <laughs> I'm the voice from a bar. Yeah. Um, so, what well, would you like to take one more Let's question? Let's take another question. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I'm Larry Joseph. Uh, ah, thank you. thank you for your questions. You emailed a whole lot of big questions. Yes. So, this, this is an extension, uh, but I'll make it simple. I think some of the reason clinicians think emotions are unconscious is a very day occurrence. Somebody has an angry facial expression, a contemptuous facial expression. Uh, you ask them how they feel. They're not fe aware of feeling that way. They feel somehow differently. So your theory of mind would be the person is out of touch with their feelings. They're not aware of their feelings. And either you're misinterpreting their facial expressions, but we know from Paul Heckman's work that's objective. Uh, or they're out of touch with their feelings. And the nonverbal expression of emotions you could take as evidence of the, of the activation of an affect state which the person isn't aware. Look, I, I think that, um, so what I said to Mark, um, what, what, uh, who's, oh, there he is, he's back again. For a moment I thought I'd hallucinated that Mark Blackman was here. I'm reassured, reality testing, my prediction that there's a Mark Blackman there is reconfirmed. Um, the, what I said to Mark, I want to now elaborate in light of what you're saying, because what I said to Mark is by no means a complete answer. You know, I can talk uh, endlessly on this particular question alone. The, the, the main point I'm making is that the affect, to the extent that you can call it an affect, it's felt. It, it, it's, it's conscious. It exists. Otherwise, it's not an affect. That, that's a, 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 a kind of premise of what I'm saying, and that the cognitions that belong to and explain the affect are the things that are unconscious. 
I want to add to what I said uh, to, uh, to Mark about you know, how we can misconstrue uh, uh, where the ethics belong and where they come from and you know, w w why they're there and, and, and not have any idea as to why they're there. And so you, I can add to that that I'm speaking you know, that they're basic ethics. Um, and I, I, I haven't had time to go into what we know today about the basic instinctual ethics, and that's also very important for psychoanalysis because it turns out to not be the way Freud construed it. There are much more complex, in, uh, uh, the, the, the much more complex taxonomy of instincts and the ethics that go with them. Um, but those are basic emotions. There are then also much more complex alloys of base, basic emotions combined with each other and basic emotions combined with cognitions, giving rise to much more complex uh, affective states. Like, for example, even something that is such a common and garden thing for us analysts, like guilt or shame. There isn't a basic emotional circuitry for guilt or shame. These are complex cognitions about uh, the, the affect concern there is actually separation distress, now elaborated in relation to a certain kind of object relational situation where if she sees me like this in relation to that, then I feel shame. But all that cognition is needed before you can have the feeling of shame. And the same applies, as I said, to guilt and to a great many other things. Now, those feelings, you can't even have the feeling unless you have the thoughts. You know, the thoughts are intrinsic to the having of those feelings. And I think that therefore these amalgams of feeling and thought are, are an important part of what we're talking about, and the amalgams of, of, of affect and cognition. If the patient is not able to render conscious those cognitions, they can't render conscious the feeling. The feeling won't come about. The, that amalgamated, that sort of compound feeling only exists in the context of those cognitions. That covers many of the instances um, that I guess clinicians are referring to. But um, the, the um, oh, what was the other point that I wanted? Yes, there also is this, like the phobia is a good example of it. A patient has, a, um, uh, is, is phobic about a certain place or a certain type of object. So they don't go there. Then they don't have the fear because they don't go to that object that causes the fear. And as we know, that object stands for what, you know, what actually, uh, 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 the cognitions that actually belong to that fear. The point I'm making is that you can, in your cognitive representational uh, meanderings, you can avoid certain thoughts. You don't allow certain thoughts, certain representations to occur uh, so that the affect then won't occur. And so, actually, the affect isn't occurring. That is to say, the feeling state doesn't come about, but it potentially would come about if you would allow yourself to have those cognitions. So I think that's another potential meaning of what we loosely call unconscious affect. In other words, it's a potential feeling state that you would, that you would bang into if you allowed yourself to think or do certain things, so you avoid thinking and or, or, or doing those things, so you don't have the feeling state. Do you see what I mean? So I think that these are instances of, uh, you know, which cover the kinds of things that you're talking about. But there's a lot more that could be said, unpacking that more and more and more. But the general principle is, as you can see, what I started off by saying to Mark, that first of all, there is a simple premise in my case. I believe that the meaning of the word feeling is you have to feel it. You know, if, if you're not feeling it, it isn't a feeling. It is either then something which is a potential feeling that you would have if you had that cognition, or it's a feeling that you're having that you don't know that you're having, or it's a feeling that you're having that you miss identifying as somebody else's feeling, or as a thing when in fact it's not a thing, it's a feeling, etc., etc. Or it's a, a feeling that, would, that arises from a complex amalgam of co cognitions, and if you don't allow yourself to think those thoughts, then again, that kind of feeling can't exist because that kind of feeling only exists embedded in cognitions, etc. That's how I see it. I just, to, just to be sure that you understand, on this point, I'm a fundamentalist. There, there's no such thing as an a, unconscious affect because it's an oxymoron. It doesn't make sense. An affect is is a discharge. Uh, without the, without that thing happening, uh, there is, Freud made that point that it, that cognitions are structures that persist. Affects are structures. You know, they are here and now happenings. We would like you to have some lunch. <laughs> okay. So Let's I, I look forward break. to the discussion uh, in 15 minutes' time. Thanks very much. Thank you.